Hold on, hold on, hold on. What was the hardest film to make? I know random, but chat, y'all know I just like watching random shit, bro. Y'all know I just like watching random topics about shit, bro. Pulling a 320 ton boat up a hill, shooting half a film underwater and trying to make a movie with Wesley Snipes. While making any film comes with its challenges, some truly stand out for being a total nightmare to pull off. We're here to shine a light on what we believe to be 12 of the hardest films to make. These film productions usually started with grand ambitions and ended with budgets ballooning because of an ever-growing list of oh, issues. Shit. These are films disowned by their actors or ones that nearly bankrupted studios or even had the cast and crew constantly attacked by animals. There are plenty of contenders competing for the title of hardest film to make, but as always, we want to hear from you. Which one do you think deserves the crown? Let's tackle- He just showed clips. He just showed a shit ton of clips from movies that were like the hardest movies to make. And I only recognize one of these these movies. And then Wesley Snipes. <laughs> that's that's kind of just bad, bro. The two obvious ones first. When you think of production nightmares, chances are Waterworld <gasps> and Apocalypse Now oh, are the first movies that come to mind. Shit, my heart They're the poster children for everything that can go wrong on a film set. Waterworld, often dubbed as Mad Max on Water, dives into a future where the polar ice caps have melted, drastically raising the sea level and turning Earth into a liquid planet. What? The people in the film relied on- This looks like the most boring shit ever. Mad Max on the ocean. I'm using- No, the concept is cool, but it's like, what? Like, then what, though? Like, that concept sounds cool, but it's like, then what? boats, jet skis, and makeshift floating settlements. But since the film was made in the early mid 90s, to get everything to look real, it all had to be done practically. The script went through many rewrites and when Kevin Costner signed on as the star and Kevin Reynolds as the director, Universal gave him a $100 million budget to make it happen. But Steven Spielberg- uh, What? Reynolds as the director, Universal gave him a $100 million budget to make it happen. But Steven Spielberg knew a thing- What? May I get him banned so I can use my prime sub? Yes. Yes, free, free and please, bro. I or two about the free and please difficulty with filming in open waters from Jaws warned them against doing the same. Did they listen? No, they forged ahead, battling the elements on a giant water enclosure off the coast of Hawaii. And Mother Nature wasn't playing nice. Waves pushed camera crews out of position. Costner nearly got swept out to sea during a storm while tied to a boat, and there was a near drowning incident involving Gene Triplehorn and child actress Tina Maharino. Oh, and a hurricane hit the location, wiping oh out gosh. sets which inflated the budget by millions. And as if that wasn't enough, the script was still a mess. Joss Whedon was flown in to help rewrite parts of it, describing the experience as seven weeks of hell. By the time the production wrapped up, the budget soared to $175 million, making it the most expensive movie at that time. They also filmed for 157 days instead of the originally planned 96. Oh Costner God. and Reynolds, who used to be buddies and had worked together on three other movies before, Never ended up despising again. each other by the end of this production. Creative differences drove a wedge between them, leading to Reynolds bailing on the project near the end, leaving Costner to finish it off. What? With all the drama and budget overruns making headlines, some people were practically rooting for Waterworld to flop at the box office. And while it didn't exactly do well with critics or at the box office, it did eventually become profitable with home video sales. Oh shit, okay, Apocalypse okay, well that's good. Apocalypse Now had it even worse. When the lead actor having a heart attack was one of the more minor setbacks, you know things got really chaotic. The film follows a soldier on a covert mission in the Vietnam War, hunting down a renegade colonel who's gone off the deep end with his own army in the jungle. It was directed and produced by Francis Ford Coppola, who tried to get anyone but him to direct, but fate had other plans. The film was mostly shot in the jungles of the Philippines, but before they even got rolling, they had to swap out Harvey Keitel for Martin Sheen because he just wasn't playing the character the way Coppola had it. I was about to say, why did I look like Martin Sheen? He looked different though. They had to swap out Harvey Keitel for Martin Sheen because he just wasn't playing the character the way Coppola had in mind. Wait, hold on. The first of many delays. And then came Typhoon Olga, which shut down the production and smashed up 40 to 80% of their sets, including the entire- Oh my God, Mar Charlie Sheen. Oh, it's his brother. Your Playboy Playmate set. After rebuilding and relocating some sets, filming was back on track and everyone thought the worst was behind them. But then came an overweight Marlon Brando to play Colonel Kurtz, a character- Wait, what? Dad? ...character that was supposed to be lean and consumed oh. by the jungle. Brando also hadn't bothered reading Heart of Darkness like Coppola had asked him to, so the character had to be totally reworked and Coppola had to conjure up a new ending since Brando's bulky physique didn't work with the original script. 
Brando and Coppola spent days together exploring the characters, putting the brakes on production even more. The end result? Brando wearing black and was mostly filmed in the dark to shave off a few visual pounds. But the way Brando played Kurtz couldn't have been more iconic. Then there was Sheen, who was only 36 at the time and suffered a heart attack, forcing Dang. his brother Joe Estevez to step in for some long shots and voiceovers. And let's not forget Dennis Hopper, who was apparently high the entire time and couldn't remember his lines. And these were just the issues. The movie was ambitious from day one with using real helicopters and military equipment, working with the Filipino government and having hordes of extras. There's a famous documentary diving deep into this production and you can find lots of YouTube videos dissecting Yo, don't it. I. I was a YouTube Holy jit, but shit. I've been in the streams for two months now. I'm really this enjoying it. Shout out chat for making it even more fun. Love y'all. Yeah, shout out to chat, man. Insta reels, bro. Uh, tomorrow, Wednesday. Wednesday, we'll check out the Insta reels. It too. When filming finally wrapped up, its initial 12 to $14 million budget shot up to $31 million, and what was expected to be a four month shoot ended up taking 238 days to film. Goddamn. But unlike Waterworld, Apocalypse Now was a hit with yeah. both critics and at the box I heard office. about that. Coppola's latest film was a real uphill battle as well, but for a whole different set of reasons. We're talking about Megalopolis, a passion project that I've been cooking in. Wait, that's this year. Coppola's brain for 40 years. Back in the 80s, Coppola started writing the script and even told others about it. He was all set to finance it himself, just like he did with Apocalypse Now. But then disaster struck in the form of One from the Heart, a film he also financed that was a major flop that left. Oh my god. Disaster struck in the form of One from the Heart, a film he. The budget was 26 million. 0.6 million was the return. Also financed that was a major flop that left Coppola swimming in debt. Megalopolis got shoved to the back burner while he directed a handful of other films to dig himself out of that financial Are those pit. Balls? The films were Bram Stoker's Dracula, Jack, and The Rainmaker. Fast forward okay. to 2001 and Coppola finally had enough money to greenlight his dream project. He started rounding up A-listers and even shot some footage of New York City for the film. Oh, but shit. guess what? The movie's plot where a cataclysmic disaster hits New York City and an architect sets out to rebuild it as a utopia Wrong. hit a major snag when the 9-11 attacks on New York City Wrong happened time. that same Wrong year. Time. Coppola would have needed to really change the film to be something else, so he abandoned it instead. It's kind of like what happened with Mad Max Fury Road, another film that was difficult to get made before hitting a major roadblock in 2001 when the US dollar took a nosedive against the Australian dollar post 9-11, really inflating the budget. Oh, but shit. fast forward to 2019, Megalopolis resurfaced from the depths of development hell with Coppola throwing $120 million of his own money at it after selling off a chunk of his winery empire. At the time of making this video, filming has wrapped up. It features a- <gasps> Damn, these are the holy shit. This is a good cast. Stacked ensemble, and it's set to release in 2024. No signs of production issues yet, but Adam Driver said it was one of the best shooting experiences of his life. Ooh. Fingers crossed that it'll be good. Damn, and that nigga did Star Wars. <laughs> but Coppola hasn't directed a film since 2011 and he has been nowhere near his form from the 70s. We're going back to major production issues with our next film, Werner Herzog's Fitz Geraldo. Now, That's Herzog's cool. no stranger to crazy productions, but this one takes the cake. We're talking about hauling a 320 ton boat up a steep 40 degree slope in the Peruvian Amazon. For what? The story centers around Fitz Geraldo, played by Klaus Kinski, a man who wanted to build an opera house in the Peruvian Amazon and needed to transport a steamship over a steep hill to reach a richer part of the Amazon basin. Studio suggested using miniatures on a studio backlot for the scene. That's the plot of the movie? A boat in a dream. That's the plot of the movie but Herzog wasn't having any of it. Oh, it's actually good? He wanted the real deal, so off they went to Peru. With the help of hundreds of indigenous extras and a Brazilian engineer who designed a fancy pulley system, they hoisted the boat up the... Is this a com Is it a comedy? Or like, what? Slope. Herzog even dubbed himself as the conquistador of the useless, believing no one else would do something like this ever. Not even the real Fitzcarraldo, the one the story's based on, pulled off a stunt like this. He just took his ship apart before moving it and his vessel was a mees- Oh, it's based on- Easily 32 tons. Although extremely ambitious and dangerous, resulting in many extras getting injured, there were far worse issues with this production. Two small plane crashes, a lumberman chopping off his own foot after a snake bite, and a surprise attack by scavenging tribespeople with two people getting arrows to the throat. Get the- somebody cut their foot off! 
after being bit by a snake. Get the hell out of here. Stomach. And let's not forget the scene where the ship crashes through rapids, leaving crew members injured, including cinematographer Thomas Mauck, who got his hand torn apart. And now throw Kinski and his tantrums on top of all of this, and you got quite a production on your hands. Oh, the guy shit. was a force of nature, throwing oh. fits left and right. They actually shot 40% of the film with Jason Robards before he fell ill and got swapped out for Kinski. The tantrums got so bad that an indigenous chief offered to kill Kinski for Herzog, but the director replied, no, I still need him for shooting, leave him to me. And just like with Apocalypse Now, there's a must-watch documentary called Burden of Dreams that goes over this insane production. Definitely worth a watch. We've made entire videos about both Kinski and Herzog if you want to hear more crazy stories there. We definitely recommend you check them out. Before moving on to the next film, if you're enjoying this video- Alien! I mean, so I mean, I mean, uh, 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 aliens with the, the thing. If, if you build it, they will come. Chat, what was this movie called? If you build it, they will come. What's that, what's that movie with the, if you build it, they will come? What's that one? Signs. This is Signs. That's the movie. But there's these weird aliens whose weakness is water. That shit's weak. But what's the movie with, if you build it, they will come? Far, we'd really appreciate if you like Field of Dreams. That is the creepiest shit. It's not even a creep. It's like just that, if you build it, like that shit's weird, bro. And subscribe. It really helps the channel out a lot. Anyways, let's get back to it. For this next one, let's take a breather from the ridiculously complicated productions and dive into the realm of working with difficult actors. Blade. Enter Blade Trinity, a movie that was way tougher than it had any right being. Actors being difficult to work with is nothing new. You've got your classics like Marlon Brando and Val Kilmer causing chaos on the island of Dr. Moreau, but there are so many other factors complicating that production, whereas Blade Trilogy only had one, Wesley Snipes. And I guess a bit of studio interference as well. David Goyer, the writer of all three Blade films, stepped up to direct Blade Trinity after Guillermo del Toro passed on it. Snipes, who had a blast working with del Toro on Blade 2, wasn't feeling the new director or the script Goyer wrote. And to add fuel to the fire, Snipes was dealing with some legal drama during filming, something about tax issues lurking on the horizon that would result in him going to prison years later. This combo turned Snipes into a bit of a nightmare on set. He'd straight up refuse to shoot scenes, getting to the point where if it wasn't a close-up of him, they'd use a stand-in instead. What? Patton Oswald gave us some funny details about this production, revealing that Snipes would hole up in his trailer smoking weed and at one point only communicated via post-it notes signed from Blade. All of this culminated in the legendary scene where Snipes is supposed to open his eyes, but he refused to do so. So they had to CGI in his eyes opening, which didn't look great at all. What? Oh my gosh. That looks like a goddamn TikTok fucking filter. Used to do so. So they had to CGI in his eyes opening, which didn't look great at all. The film didn't do as well as the others at the box office, and Snipes' onset antics really slowed down his career moving forward. Yeah, what is up with you, dog? Now, let's talk about a movie that took ambition to a whole new level. James Cameron's The Abyss. Cameron's mm. no stranger to pushing the boundaries of filmmaking. He's got a track record for taking on insanely difficult projects. Oh shit! Developing the technology to create both avatars was difficult and really delayed when the films could have been made. And Titanic was a monster of its own. Yeah. With the real dives to the Titanic, the ship for filming being built to full scale, and having to con- Oh, what? I ain't know this. I didn't know this part. ...of its own. With the real dives to the Titanic, the ship for- What the fuck? filming being built to full scale, and having to control up to 1,000 extras and 800 crew members at any given time. But the abyss? That's a whole other beast. The film follows a US recovery team on the hunt for a sunken American submarine mm -hmm. in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. About this production, Cameron said, I knew this was gonna be a hard shoot. Nigga, are you doing an interview underwater? But even I had no idea just how hard. I don't ever wanna go through this again. 40% of the film took place underwater, with the cast and crew often clocking in six-day, 70-hour work weeks in the six-month production. The filming took place in two giant water tanks inside an unfinished nuclear power plant. Actors were usually at a depth of 11 meters for no more than an hour, while Cameron and the crew were 17 meters deep for five hours at a time. There were many near drownings, with even the film star Ed Harris getting a close call. Oh, he was shit. also towed 10 meters deep with his helmet full of liquid, which he described as the most painful moment of filming. To no surprise, he has publicly disowned the film and doesn't want to talk about it. Damn, the conditions him. of the tank made it brutal as well. Blooming algae reduced the water's visibility to only six meters, uh. and the chlorine levels were so high it burnt many divers' skin and bleached their hair. Fuck. Oh, and one time, the lights went out mid-shoot. It was so dark they couldn't even see their own hands in front of them. And then there's Cameron, with a signature dictatorial style of directing, barking orders through a PA system. Yeah, nah, I'ma need, I'ma need a big, big pay raise, bro. 
I'm gonna need a big, big, you got, you're gonna have to up the, the, the money, bro. Anytime someone dared to complain, he'd hit him with, I'm letting you breathe. What more do you want? Many people claim that filming the abyss was the hardest thing they've ever done. But despite all the blood, sweat, and tears, the really, abyss didn't exactly yeah, make a really, really good the movie, box though. office. Sure, it got some love from the critics, but it wasn't as lucrative as Cameron's other projects. Now, let's talk about two movies that went down in history for all the wrong reasons, Cleopatra and Heaven's Gate. These films are prime examples of budgets spiraling out of control. First up, we've got Cleopatra, which hit theaters back in 1963. It was the highest grossing film of the year, and yet it still lost money. But how? Well, they built a whopping 79 sets and made 26,000 costumes, with the lead Elizabeth Taylor's wardrobe alone costing an eye-watering $194,800. I mean, it looks good though. It, it, it does look good though. And Taylor was given what was at the time a record-breaking salary of $1 million. The film oh my gosh. That's a record. Well, I guess at the time. When did that movie come out? That's probably like year, years ago. The film was very great. Oh, 1960s? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, she was balling. She was, so never mind. She was balling. She was balling. And, but it was the production issues that helped make it the most expensive movie at the time. Holy the first setback was with Taylor getting <gasps> sidelined by health issues. Near the beginning of filming, she was diagnosed with meningitis, which caused production so to keep getting pushed by weeks what? until being postponed indefinitely. During this time, Joseph Mankiewicz came in to replace the original director, Ruben Mamoulian, who in the first 16 weeks already went over budget, spending $7 million for just 10 minutes of unusable film. Filming took even longer to resume because Taylor was hospitalized again, this time with pneumonia, which needed a tracheotomy to heal her. When filming finally resumed, it was hectic. Mankiewicz wasn't thrilled with the script, so he threw it out and started from scratch. This is Mankiewicz stressing me was out. filming by day and writing the script by night, and even the cinematographer collapsed from exhaustion. There were many reshoots, script rewrites, and sets getting torn down and rebuilt because they moved locations. All of this really caused the budget to soar. And just when they thought they were in the clear, 20th Century Fox, the studio funding the film, decided to pull the plug on some battle scenes and terminate Taylor's contract early. Oh my After Mankiewicz completed and showed his first cut to the execs, he was fired with the going over budget being blamed on him. Oh, but since he was writing while shooting the script, Mankiewicz was the only one who really knew how everything should fit together, so they hired him back to see the film's completion. The film's final budget was $31.1 million, and although it lost money in its first year, it did end up making a profit the years after with its rentals and distribution rights. What a mess. The same can't be said for our next film, Heaven's Gate, that bombed so hard at the box office that people were dubbing Waterworld's box office issues as Kevin's Gate. Oh it only God. earned $3.5 million on a $44 million. Oh my God. budget and many point to it as one of the reasons for director driven films going away. Coming off the high of two Oscars for The Deer Hunter, director Michael Cimino was all set to tackle his next project. Have it Why he look like Ray? No, what's the guy? What's the guy? What's that comedian's name, bro? Oh my gosh. Hold on. Fuck, he looks just like he looks like, bro. Fuck. Oh my God, I can't remember. No, not Ray Romano. I thought I was about to say Ray Romano, but nah, it's, an, it's another guy. I can't remember his name, bro. <laughs> I can't remember his name, bro. Ray William Johnson? Is it? No, I, let me see. Hold on. Fuck, no, I can't remember his name, bro. Vince Gate with an approved budget of $11.6 million. But there was something in the way of creating this Western epic. James himself. Cameron doesn't do what James Cameron does for James Cameron. James Cameron does what James Cameron does because he's James Cameron. Uh, no, wait, that's actually true, though. Chimino had perfectionist tendencies and they were persistent on set. They were already five days behind schedule by only the sixth day of filming. He demanded a ton of retakes, sometimes even 50 retakes of a single scene. He even waited for certain clouds he liked to get into the shot before rolling. Many scenes were shot during golden hour, a time right before sunset that would only last five minutes, so they'd only have a maximum of a few takes each day to get those shots. Damn. There was a lot of waiting around on set to the point where Sir John Hurt went to film The Elephant Man before coming back and continuing with this film. Chimino's perfectionism peaked when he requested a street that was built for the film to be torn down because it didn't look right. He wanted it six feet wider. And instead of tearing down just one side of the street and moving it six feet, he wanted both sides torn down and moved three feet Who do you think you so are? 
are. To no surprise, the film's budget shot up to $44 million by the end of it. But what was surprising was that when the studio United Artists started to investigate why they were paying so much for renting land, they found that the owner of the land was none other than Michael Cimino. No wonder he took his sweet time filming. The film received a lot of critical backlash, especially with its notorious amount of animal abuse and it was pulled from theaters until a further re-release. The owner of United Artists didn't like the effect the film had on its public image on top of the financial damage, so they sold the studio to the owner of Metro Goldwyn Mayer a year after the film's release where it became a subsidiary of MGM. Now let's talk about our most recent film on the list with 2015's The Revenant, whose production was dubbed as a living hell and for good reason. This film was so, like the way this was shot though, this movie was so fire. This was, I love this movie follows Leonardo DiCaprio as Hugh Glass, a fur trader out for revenge after being left for dead by his own crew. Alejandro Iñárritu directed and co-wrote the film, and the original budget was set at $60 million. There were a few factors that made this an incredibly difficult film to make. The film taking place in the freezing wilderness, being dead set on shooting only with natural light, and putting Leo through hell so that he can win an Oscar. Most of the film was done in the freezing wilderness of Canada's Alberta region during winter, before hopping over to Argentina once the snow started to melt. They shot the film chronologically, dragging out what was supposed to be an 80-day shoot by a few more months. This was because filming with natural light meant they didn't have much time throughout the day to film. And working in such remote places, the time it takes to arrive and return wasted 40% of the days. Filming proved very difficult for everyone. You'll ever just be chilling alone and be playing with your boots hairs? Me neither. The temperature was hitting up to negative 25 degrees Celsius, which was causing equipment to break. Although no serious injuries happened, one by one, crew members quit or were fired, with Inarito explaining, As a director, if I identify a violin that is out of tune, I have to take that from the orchestra. And Leo endured a lot during this production. He went in frozen rivers, slept in animal carcasses, ate raw bison liver. Wait, like for real? Like really? Like, we couldn't get props? A violin that is out of tune, I have to take that from the orchestra. And Leo endured a lot during this production. He went in frozen rivers, slept in animal carcasses, ate raw bison liver, learned a lot in advance to prepare for the character, and just like everyone else, dealt with the freezing weather. About the making of the film, Leo said, I can name 30 or 40 sequences that were some of the most difficult things I've ever had to do. The original $60 million budget shot up to $135 million by the end of the production. Damn. But it was a huge box office hit and Leo finally did get that Oscar, even if he had to be attacked by a bear yeah, to get bullshit. it. He Speaking of been. being attacked by animals, our next film, 1981's Roar, had the most animal-related injuries of any film, often being labeled as the most dangerous film ever made. The film follows a naturalist living in an African nature preserve full of big cats. It stars husband and wife Noel Marshall and Tippi Hedren who created and financed the film together. The film was made to raise awareness to poaching and had an initial budget of $3 million. During its lengthy production, they accumulated about 150 big cats along with some elephants and various large birds. Is, the problem was that most of these animals were untrained, resulting is, in tons of injuries. So dangerous. There are estimates that at least 70 of the 140 person crew were injured during production, with newer estimates believing it to be over 100 of them. Marshall had his hand bitten by a lion during a fight scene. Later, he was bitten in the leg. Then another 10 injuries by the time production wrapped up, Jesus. even being diagnosed with blood poisoning and gangrene. Oh his wife, God. Hedron, was bit on the head by a lion during oh a promo shoot with God. his teeth scraping her skull. She also fractured an ankle when an elephant picked her up by it with its trunk. Oh my that God. same elephant kicked its trainer, breaking her shoulder. Oh, and the cinematographer got ah. scalped by a lion. And the assistant director was bitten in the throat and jaw by a lion. Fuck. So I hope you get the picture. This production was brutal to get through. And to add insult to injury, the production dragged on for years longer than expected with lots of problems with the weather and flooding, raising the- Who wants to show up to set every day with these type of injuries, bro? Budget from $3 million to a whopping $17 million. Niggas just gonna watch The Lion King. Fuck this shit. And it did terribly at the box. Oh my God. Two Y'all did all this for $2 million? And this is the poster. I mean, the poster kind of lit hard, though. Roar, a ferocious comedy. Oh, God office. Some say they were struck by the curse of the exorcist because of Noel Marshall's ties to the film as an executive producer. Sticking with the theme of filming animals, we got 1967's Dr. Doolittle. Doctor, now, the OG Dr. Doolittle. While this one might not have been as intense as Roar, it still had its fair share of problems. To make this film, they worked with over 1,200 live animals ranging from dogs to pigs to even giraffes. The film follows a veterinarian who can communicate with animals played by Rex Harrison whose poor behavior on set made the production even worse. 
Some of the animal antics on set were straight out of a comedy sketch. A goat ate the script. A fawn ate paint and needed its stomach pumped. Squirrels ate important parts of the scenery and the sheep kept peeing on Harrison, forcing many retakes. Bruh. The best story I read was when filming a difficult scene where all the animals had to sit still, Harrison randomly stopped singing. He said he heard the director Richard Fleischer yell cut, but Fleischer denied it. While arguing about it, they both heard it this time, and it turned out that it was a parrot yelling cut. Oh Even something as simple as putting ducks into a pond hilarious. didn't go their way, where the ducks began sinking and couldn't swim because it wasn't the time of year where their feathers were water repellent. On top of all the animal issues, they had problems with the weather, crew members getting sick, and a disgruntled local resident attempted to blow up the set with a homemade bomb. You know, just the usual things that happen when filming. The film's budget increased from its initial $6 million to $17 million, and it flopped at the box office. Bro, all that just for Eddie Murphy to come and make this forgettable. <laughs> all right, no disrespect to the OG, my fault. And with critics. And our final hardest film to make is 2002's Russian Ark. It's a bit of an experimental film following a ghost drifting through St. Petersburg's Winter Palace over various periods of time. The difficulty came in the way they filmed it, all in one take. No secret cuts like in Birdman. The film goes through 33 rooms of the Russian Hermitage Museum with over 2,000 actors and three live orchestras, all in a single 96 minute take. The museum offered to shut down for two days to film, but director Alexander Sukharov rejected the offer and said he only needed one. They recorded using a Sony HDW F900 camera and had someone carry a connected external hard disk while following the cameraman. With only four hours Wait, I want to watch this. Of daylight available, Sukharov only had enough time for a few attempts. His first attempt failed at the five minute mark and the other two much later. Oh my God. Bro, this is like doing a speed run, bro. This is like doing a fucking speed run and having to reset like three hours in. This left him with not a lot of battery and daylight left, enough for one good take. And his next take got him what he needed, except there is a shot of a violinist looking directly at the camera. Nigga! Oh my God. That just pissed me off for him, bro. Oh my, I know he sat through that footage and was like, yo, we actually... Is that fucking Benson? Get Benson in this goddamn room right now! <laughs> are you- Look at the screen! Look at the screen! Who's that? Oh, that's me? Yeah! What are you doing? Looking at the- Looking at the goddamn camera! Do you wanna re- Do I wanna reshoot it? Get this guy out of my goddamn face! Bring me another bag! Bring me another bag! <laughs> at one point. I can't even imagine how stressful it must have been to achieve this, especially given that Sukharov only spoke Russian while the cinematographer only spoke German. So they had to have a translator with them during the frantic filming. Russian arc to this day remains as having the longest single shot in a film, and I don't see it getting dethroned anytime yeah, soon. I, I, and those it. were 12 of the hardest films Hold to- on. What was the name of this film? Peterberg's Winter Palace over various periods of those were 12 of the hardest films to make but before we finish we wanted to throw in a bonus one the Lord of Russian, the Rings trilogy Russian yeah art. we know it's not a single movie but it had to be mentioned for how difficult it was Gotta to watch make that movie. and it wasn't even some production nightmare sure you had a broken toe here and there but the difficulty came purely from how overly ambitious and grand it was the amount of work needed for every single part of the process was just insane great movie from adapting one of the literary works that was deemed unfilmable to the filming of all three films at once something we'd never see happen today wait wait, and wait. you can't forget about its perfect blend they shot all of these films at once what the fuck boring ad movie yo chill i used to be just like you man i was a harry potter fan and, and i remember at the time people was it was like pitting harry potter against the lord of the rings i'd be like fuck the lord of the rings bro harry potter really better da, da, da. then i sat down and watched the trilogy in the prequel i think that it was a the, the hobbit that's just hard, bro. Thing of practical and digital effects and how much it pushed the industry forward. Every time you watch the movie, it's just shocking something like this was even made. It showed Hollywood that nothing was unfilmable. There are lots of documentaries and videos. And now they're doing everything, bro. <laughs> now they're just filming everything. Remaking shit. Any book that they can find, bro. Any old movie they can find that hasn't been touched. Oh my God, bro that dive deep into the making of these films. We don't want to overstay our welcome because this was already a pretty long video. Nah, this was a good video, bro. It could have been an hour.
So there you have it. 12 films we think were the hardest to make. Are there ones we missed that were even more difficult? Share your thoughts below. If you enjoyed the video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe and check out our Patreon for some cool perks. But in W video, dude. Shout out to film. Shout out to film stock, man. Shout out to film stock, dude. Um, okay, hold on.